Good evening and welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar for this evening. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and we're glad that you could join us. The uh, Commemorative Air Force, known as the CAF, and you can help support us through your uh, donations to uh, the uh, either as a, a member or you can also join us and as donations. You can make a donation to help support any of the aircraft that are uh, a part of the CAF fleet. If you'd like to find out more, just visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. Now, as you enjoy tonight's presentation, some questions may come to mind. Just type those into the uh, comment section. We'll be watching uh, Facebook Live and YouTube, and we will uh, try to address those questions as the presentation goes on. If not, we'll save time at the end, and uh, we'll go through uh, any questions you may have for our guest tonight. Chris Kolakowski, who is the director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. Tonight, we're going to take a look back at Pearl Harbor, the road to uh, Pearl Harbor, as we celebrate or commemorate, I should say, the 80th anniversary of that uh, day of infamy, December 7th, 1941. Chris, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Steve, and thanks for having me again. Um, it's great to work with you and the great folks at the Commemorative Air Force. Um, you do great work preserving not just the, obviously the airplanes that flew and the, the machinery of, of World War II and, and the area, era immediately before and after, but also the important stories. I mean, this war, um, even when they were fighting it, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff referred to World War II as one of the most, the most important event in the last 1,500 years since the fall of Rome. And in many ways, to understand the modern world today, you have to understand World War II. And so helping keep these memories alive um, it's, it's wonderful work that you do, and I'm, I'm happy to, to support and, and always look forward to working with you guys. I am a supporter. I always have to point this out. I break out my uh, commemorative Air Force pin, um, so I'm happy to support the mission. Uh, but what, what, what I want to talk about tonight, as many of you probably have uh, in the audience have probably figured out or have probably been, paid attention the last couple of days, uh, we're passing the 80th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor yesterday, and today is the 80th anniversary of a variety of other events in the Pacific and Franklin Delano Roosevelt's famous speech, the Day of Infamy speech, uh, asking the United States for a declaration of war. And the United States basically came into World War II at this point. Um, what I want to do, and um, in the time that we have tonight, and I know with a, with a crowd like this, there's going to be some good questions coming into Steve. Um, but what I want to do tonight is, is I don't necessarily want to talk about Pearl Harbor itself on December 7th, although we will touch on that. But I want to provide some context and I want to provide some background. And essentially, if nothing else, ask the question, what brought us to the point where Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and it decided to attack the United States and U.S. allies, Britain and Netherlands and, and other countries as well? And that's what we want to spend. I want to spend my time tonight talking about. Let's see if my slides will advance. There we go. If you get nothing else out of tonight's presentation, I just have a couple of maps I'm gonna show you as we go. It's not, it's not an extensive amount of slides, but we're gonna spend some time on some maps. But if you get nothing else out of this presentation tonight, I want you to walk away with these two points. First of all, the path to the outbreak of the Pacific War in December, 1941, it spanned a lot of years. It spanned many years. It had many twists and turns. It could have changed various times, but at the end of the day, it came to Pearl Harbor. The second thing I would point out to you is the outcome of this story, and I've touched on this a little bit already in my opening remarks, and the resulting war, World War II, remade the Pacific in ways that are still affecting the world today. And so this story, even though it is eight decades old, is relevant from a lot of standpoints today. Let's take a look first before we even get into the story of uh, the road to war, the road to Pearl Harbor. Let us first start with some geography. And this is a map of the Pacific. Uh, many of you in the audience may have traveled out there as I have. Many of you may have ever been stationed out there in various places if you were in service or whatever. Um, but let's, let's give a general orientation here to the Pacific just so that you understand what the area that we're dealing with here. Um, I'm gonna use my cursor a lot as a pointer. Uh, this map, which comes from the West Point Atlas, as does the other map I will show you. North is at the top. Here in the northeastern corner is North America, the continental United States and Alaska, of course, Canada. And then if you come out from the United States, where I'm circling with my cursor, that is the Hawaiian Islands, Pearl Harbor, Oahu, the Hawaiian Islands here. Midway is right here at the international date line. And then as you come across the Pacific, 
you come to the Japanese home islands, which I'm circling with my cursor here. Northwest is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union. Today, of course, we know it as Russia, China. And by the way, these frontiers are 1939 frontiers. I should point that out. That's why China looks like it does. China's here. And then if you come down south of China, you come to French Indochina, and I will explain some of the colonies and some of the political situation in a little bit. This is French Indochina, which today we know as Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Here's Thailand, Burma, India. This is the Dutch East Indies. Today we know it as Indonesia. Right here is British Malaya and Singapore which we know today as Malaysia. Australia to the south, you can see the northern tip of New Zealand right here, the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, Rabaul, some of the great battlefields of 1943, right where I've got my cursor. Gilberts right here, Marshalls, the Marianas, Caroline Islands where I have my cursor. And then last but not least, the Philippines, the Philippine Islands, where I have my cursor here, and right above it, Formosa, Taiwan, which has been in the news of late. So that's the basic overview of the Pacific and some of the key locations that you may be familiar with or you may have, have heard from, uh, mentioned in various sources. The other thing I'll point out to you about the Pacific, and this is something that needs to be remembered, is it's vast, it's a big area. Manila, and the Philippines in 1941 was a U.S. colony. It was a Commonwealth. It was on its way to independence in 19 its way to independence in 1946. When you were in Manila, you were as far away from the continental United States as you can be, and still be on U.S. territory. From Manila to Honolulu is 5,000 miles. Now, to give you some perspective, the continental United States, from Virginia Beach to San Francisco is about 3,300 3, miles wide. So you can sink the continental United States with plenty of room to spare between Honolulu and Manila. Honolulu to San Francisco is another 2,000 miles. So this is a very large area. Tokyo to Singapore, 1,800 miles. Manila to the China coast to Hong Kong, 500 miles. Manila to Japan, 1,100 miles. So Japan is much closer to the battlefields of the Pacific than the United States is. This actually is a battle space. When you think about the Pacific, you think about the war in the Pacific, it's a battle space and it's, it's an environment in which the United States, it's, it's nothing like the United States has fought in before and arguably I would argue since. And so that's something that needs to be kept in mind before we even start in on the history, we need to understand and have a basic grasp of Pacific geography. So I wanted to start with that. Now the road to Pearl Harbor has its start in the decades before 1941. In some ways, it has been argued by George Pfeiffer and others, and I would tend to agree, it actually started in 1853. Japan, since 1600, had been closed off to the world. And so when Commodore Matthew Perry and the United States Navy show up in Tokyo Bay in 1853 and open Japan to the world, Japan is stunned by the new technology, the steamships, the gunpowder, things of that nature. <clears throat> they had gunpowder, but the muzzle-loading rifles, things, things like that. This touches off a huge period of reform, social turbulence, culminating in the Meiji Restoration of 1868 and then a variety of, of internal wars um, throughout the 1870s. If you've seen the Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai, that's an impressionistic look at this period in Japan. Japan has more in common in 1853 with medieval Europe than it does with any industrialized nation in 1853. Technologically, Japan goes in, in the period 1853 to 1941 from the technology of medieval Europe to modern 1941 technology. It's a tremendous period of progress for Japan. But it also has created a national feeling that Japan is, is behind it's technologically, but also behind in certain development. And one of the things that, that the Japanese very quickly realize, and this is something that is true today of the Japanese home islands, there's not really significant natural resources on the home islands. 
the Japanese home islands have produced enough food, produced enough agricultural products to feed the people. And there were 74 million Japanese in 1941. To, they, there's enough to feed the people, but the modern resources that you need for a modern economy or a modern war machine, a modern military, are just not present in great quantities, if at all, on the home islands. So Japan needs to import most of what it will need to become a, a modern technological power. By 1941 standards, it's still true. And so Japan will begin to look to the southern part, what they will later term the southern resources area, and begin to import from there and from the United States, basically coming up the South China Sea. That South China Sea, again, is still a strategic piece of, piece of water today. Japan also begins to realize that if there's, there's what they term a line of national interest, places where they need to either dominate or they need to either physically control to ensure the security of the home islands. And that starts Japan on a progression of expansion. They'll take over the Ryukyu Islands in Okinawa in the 1870s. You see, they'll take over the Bonins and the Volcano Islands at the same time. They'll fight a war with China and take Taiwan in 1895. They'll participate in the Boxer Rebellion. And then 1904 and 1905, they'll fight the Russians um, in, in the area of Manchuria, in the area of Korea. Um, they will open this with a sneak attack on the Russian fleet at Port Arthur, which is where I have my cursor here on the map. I want you to remember that. Um, they'll open with a, with a uh, sneak attack on the fleet there and then fight for about a year and a half. And by that point, the Russians demoralized will basically give up and sue the Japanese for peace. That's how Japan gets control of the rest of the Kuril Islands and Southern Sakhalin Island right here. It will also be a major step in the annexation of Korea in 1910. So by the time of World War I, you can see Japan is already developing quite a regional power, quite a regional hegemony. At the same time this is going on, I want you to look at what else is going on in Asia. The French have taken over Indochina in the 1860s. The British are in India and Burma. The Dutch have taken over the Netherlands East Indies and that they have established a colony there. The British own Singapore and Malaya, as we've discussed. The United States has fought the war with Spain in 1898, which gave them control of, among other things, Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, but also, oh, as I move my slides, unfortunately, gives them Guam, Wake Island, and most importantly, the Philippine Islands. So the United States is becoming an expanding Pacific power as well. And if you look at where Japan is expanding and where the United States are expanding, they're expanding into some of the same areas and into competing directions. And that's something that needs to be kept in mind. 1914, outbreak of World War I. This is something else that needs to be remembered and we will hear about again very shortly. A European war starts and it creates opportunities for Japan in the Far East. What are those opportunities? Keep in mind that in 1914, the Marianas, the Carolines, the Marshalls, and what becomes the Australian Mandate, the Bismarck Archipelago, these are all German, as is the colony of Tsingtao, which is right where I have my cursor. Japan, with British reinforcements, will be a part of taking Tsingtao, the siege of Tsingtao, in August of 1914. And the Japanese forces will also push into these areas and will take effective control of them. And then after the war, the League of Nations will give these colonies, except for the Bismarck Archipelago, which goes to the Australians, the rest of them go to Japan. This red oval that I'm circling here with my cursor. And so Japan, all of a sudden, World War I has made Japan not just a power in and around the home islands, but has actually given Japan a central Pacific presence and a central Pacific empire. And that's something that needs to be borne in mind as well. So where are we 100 years ago right now? 100 years ago right now, something significant is going on in Washington. It's called the Washington Naval Treaty, where the five major naval powers get together in Washington to determine naval control, naval arms limitation in the wake of World War I. And the fact that Japan is one of the five powers, along with the British, the Dutch, the Italians, and the French, 
should tell you all you need to know about where Japan's development is in the world and it, where uh, the recognition of Japan as a major international power and a major international player, certainly in the Pacific, if not around the world. And I should point out that Japan during World War I actually sent a squadron of destroyers to help escort British merchantmen and, sh and troop ships in the Pacific. So Japan has demonstrated that the Navy can operate not just in the Pacific, but can operate around the world. The Washington Naval Conference from Japan's perspective, however, is an insult because when they set the limits of navies, they set Japan's limit of navies, limit of tonnage for battleships and things of that nature to 60% of the United States and Britain. The United States and Britain are both given, it's called the five to five to three ratio. US and Britain are five, Japan is three. And this is a huge insult to the Japanese because they've been beginning to build a new fleet, they begin to build a global fleet. They had to scrap several ships. They turned a few of them into aircraft carriers, Akagi and Kaga. But the big thing is they look at it and say, well, wait, why aren't we considered the equal of the United States and Britain? Arguments that the United States and Britain both have interests in the Pacific and the Atlantic, where Japan has primary interest only in the Pacific, and therefore it doesn't need the big navies fell on deaf ears. But in 1922, Japan allowed its alliance with Britain to lapse. And so that these are irritants that begin to, in, uh, begin to really push apart Japan and the West. And it's about this time that a thought begins to really germinate. It had always kind of been there going back to Perry in some ways, but certainly it begins to germinate now that there's going to be a war in the Pacific in the foreseeable future. And it's going to involve Japan and the United States. It's not just in Tokyo, it's not just in Japan where this feeling begins to, be, begins to manifest itself. The United States, as the 1920s goes on, begins to also think in terms of the possibility of war in the Pacific and it will involve Japan. And that's where you begin to get the development of what becomes known as War Plan Orange, you begin to get the famous war games at the US, US, Navy, uh, US Naval War College. Um, and both sides begin to assume that, the other, that there's going to be a war involving the other. And that will color cloud both sides thinking and will be a factor in both sides thinking as they approach the crises in the Pacific in the late 30s and the early 1940s. Japan in 1931 makes, takes a major step forward in expanding the empire by moving into Northwest China and taking Manchuria, which they set up as the independent state of Manchukuo. Japan wants more, and they have been taking a belligerent stand against China. They skirmished with Chinese forces in Shanghai, in, uh, which I'm putting my cursor on right now, in 1932. And then in 1937, at the Marco Polo Bridge outside of Peking, which today is Beijing, at the Marco Polo Bridge, Chinese and Japanese forces start a war. Well, let's put it this way. In Chinese eyes, it's a war. The Second Sino-Japanese War, as they call it, the first one being the one where they lost Taiwan. Japan never calls it a war. They call it the China Incident, which to me is a tremendously revealing name when you think about it. Japan thinks that they can uh, knock off Chiang Kai-shek's China fairly quickly in a series of intense maneuvers in, the, in 1937 and 1938 and even in 1939. You can see they pretty much conquer most of eastern China and all the major ports with the exception of British Hong Kong on the east coast of China. They've done tremendous damage to the Chinese military. They've occupied many major Chinese cities, but yet Chiang Kai-shek continues with Western aid, I might add, continues to resist. One of the events that touches off during all this has geopolitical ramifications today because the Japanese continue to deny it was as bad as the Chinese say it was, and that's the December 1937 Rape of Nanking, as it's called, when they occupied Chiang Kai-shek's former capital, having also inadvertently, as they say, bombed the U.S. gunboat Panay from the Yangtze River Patrol um, in Dece December 12th, 13th, 1937. And the memory of that and the contested versions of that between the Japanese and the People Repu People's Republic of China continues to be of geographic and geopolitical relevance to the Pacific today.
But nonetheless, when you look at the map, you'll notice that by 1939, and that's where we are, the, the situation in 1st of September, 1939, you'll notice that Japan has conquered a significant part of China, but they've also sucked themselves into a very large quagmire. Now, keep in mind, by the way, that by square mileage, China is only a, only a, a, a smidge, maybe a little bit more larger than the, all 50 states of the United States today. So when you look at map of China, it's basically the size of the United States. And so when you think about how big the United States is and how, how much, how vast it would be for an invading army to conquer it, you see the problem the Japanese have. So they've got a they've got a, a quagmire in China. They've got a war. They they don't really have an end in sight. And something else that needs to be borne in mind is that Japan has never lost a war in her 2,600 years of existence. The first war that Japan loses in her 2,600 years of existence is 1945, at the end of World War II. That hasn't happened yet, and that's something that needs to be borne in mind as well. So by the first of September 1939, this is the situation in Asia. Now, what happens on the 1st of September, 1939? Germany invades Poland. And by the way, in case you're wondering with my last name, my grandfather was in the Polish army, ended up getting captured by the Soviets, um, and ended up in London and ultimately the United States after the war. So the 1st of September, 1939, that's when World War II starts. It will later merge. Some people argue that World War II started at the Marco Polo Bridge. Um, to me, the wars will merge with the attack on Pearl Harbor, but that's maybe another lecture for another time, Steve. But anyway, 1st of September, 1939. So now you have a European war that breaks out. What happens in the spring of 1940? The Blitz on France, the Blitz on Norway, the Blitz on Netherlands, the Blitz on Belgium. The fall of France, 22nd June, 1940. What does that do out here? The European war and the fall of those countries creates opportunity for Japan. Because with the Dutch having been overrun and the Dutch government being in exile in London, there's no real support they can spare for their colonies out here in the Far East. Same with the French right here. The British have their own problems because they're now the only major ally left. The Battle of Britain in the fall of 1940, the, the Western desert campaigns that begin to go that will involve Erwin Rommel in 1941. The British have very little to, to spare for the Far East. So all of a sudden, these gr Western grips on these colonies begins to weaken. And Japan realizes that there's an opportunity here. And so in the summer of 1940, they negotiate the northern half of French Indochina, dominion and control of the northern half of French Indochina, with the Vichy pro-Axis government. And Japan, of course, will ally itself with, with Italy and Germany in September of 1940. Coincidentally, they divide French Indochina at this point at the 17th parallel, which will be the borderline for North and South Vietnam as well after World War II. Fun fact that may, uh, may win you a trivia contest one day. This makes everybody sit up and take notice and ratchets up significant tension for both sides, on both sides, both in the West, and when I say that, I mean the United States, the Dutch, and the British, but also in Asia more generally, because Japan has definitely taken a major aggressive step in the direction of Southeast Asia, which in itself is a term, by the way, that comes about in 1943 during World War II. Why is Japan looking in this direction? Remember what we talked about at the very beginning, the resources that Japan needs, oil, rubber, which at the time was not synthetic, tin, timber, the, the, the materials, the raw materials you need for a modern war machine or a modern economy can all be found here. And Japan is beginning to see opportunities to move its, as they've been calling it, the line of national interest down into this area, down into what we know as Southeast Asia. And that's what they do with this move in the French Indochina. The Germans will invade the Soviet Union 22nd June, 1941. Japan had just signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviets. They had also done some border fighting with the Soviets in September, 1939. And to uh, make a long story very short, 
It did not go well for the Japanese. And so they'd signed a non-aggression pact here, and that gives them an escape hatch, because at this point, the Germans are asking them to go north into Siberia. The Japanese decide that's not a good idea. There's nothing up here for us in Siberia, whereas what we need to keep the war in China going is available, and our Navy, which is under construction under a major expansion program, is available to the south. And as one of the foreign ministers will now say, don't miss the bus. There's opportunities to the south that are not to the north. And so the Japanese decide not to attack. When a Russian spy, Richard Sorga, reports this to Stalin, Stalin is able to denude Siberia. And those are the armies that 80 years ago, this past weekend, launched the counteroffensive that saved Moscow. And again, Steve, maybe a whole of the talk for a whole of the time is the Russian campaign and what happened. But that is, needs to be borne in mind. July 1940, end of July 1941, 26th of July 1941, the Japanese unilaterally move and conquer and take over the southern half of French Indochina. Major move. It puts them within air striking distance of Singapore. Singapore and Malaya, the, if India is the crown, crown, in the, and crown jewel in the, in the crown of the British Empire, as it was correctly called, if India is that, Malaya ain't that far behind. Malaya was a net credit to the British Empire from 1895 to 1941. And something like 90% of the world's rubber came from the Malayan Peninsula. It's important to the British war machine, just like the Japanese are eyeing those resources as well. When French Indochina is taken, this changes everything. And a couple things happen within a succession of a few days. First of all, a rearmament program begins in the Philippines. They recall General Douglas MacArthur to the colors and begin to ship troops, equipment, and begin to, to, to set up the defenses of the Philippines, strengthen those defenses, which had been allowed to, to languish um, in the interwar period, largely. But the big thing from the Japanese perspective is that the United States, the Dutch, and the British all embargo Japan. No trade, and they shut off the oil. This means that Japan now faces a crisis point, and they face a very real deadline. Because if Japan does nothing, they will run out of oil in 12 months, literally run out of oil. No ships moving, no planes flying, no tanks or trucks moving. The economy grinds to a halt. So they have 12 months to do something. The price of renewed trade is ending the war in China. Japan has a choice. The first option, do nothing. We've already discussed why that's not a good idea, because they will literally run out of fuel and the country will implode. That's not a real option. Second option is this one, take the deal. But what did I mention earlier? Japan has never lost a war in her 2600 year history. Are they ready to admit defeat? Are they willing to admit defeat? They are not willing to admit defeat and they are not interested in being blackmailed. My term, not theirs, being leveraged, blackjacked, whatever term you wanna use, they are not interested in being, being leveraged into pulling back and admitting defeat for the first time in their long history. So retreat is not really an option. That brings us to the third option, which is to seize by force what is necessary and take and hold the Southern resources area, which means war with Britain and war with the Dutch. And as one of the foreign one of the ministers says at this time as well, this is a treasure lying in the street waiting to be picked up in the Dutch East Indies and in the British colonies down here. So that's what they view. They view this as a, a you know, something ready to be picked up, very easily grabbed, easily obtained. But take a look at what is in between the home islands and this southern resources area here. The Philippines. There's a chance that the Japanese, if they attack the Dutch and the British, the United States may not move. They may not take any action. 
But look at the strategic position of the Philippines. It is, sits directly on the sea routes from the South China Sea north to the home islands. If you're a responsible strategist, can you really run that risk, especially because a lot of the planning assumptions for both the Army and the J Navy for the Japanese have assumed that sooner or later there's going to be a war with the United States? And the fact that the United States is building up their defenses at the Philippines and Wake Island, and to a certain extent Guam as well, certainly Hawaii and Midway as well, where the U.S. Pacific Fleet has arrived, arrived in 1940 in Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> so when you think about that, you realize you have to go after the United States. And if you're going to go after the United States and the Philippines, you also have to go after one of the other great pillars of U.S. defense in the Pacific, and that is the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. Pacific Fleet at Pearl, along with the MacArthur's Air Force here in Luzon in northern, the northern Philippines, and British Force Z, Prince of Wales and Repulse, down here at Singapore, are the three great pillars of allied power in the Pacific. And so Japan decides we are gonna go to war for what we need. Retreat is unthinkable, doing nothing is, is not an option. We are going to go to war, seize what we can, seize as much as we can, and then hold it against all comers. In the back of their minds is the experience with the Russians, 1904, 1905, open with a surprise attack, fight and seize what you need, deal some damage to the, to the enemy, hold on, and in about a year and a half to two years, it's expected they might come to the peace table. That's the Japanese plan. That's the Japanese plan in general. Let's look at it a little bit here in detail. This map actually illustrates a lot of what I've just been talking about here. And you can see each one of these red arrows shows a Japanese attack that will open the war. And you can see here, this red oval is the Japanese objective area here, is to secure this entire area. And you can see what it is. Watch the USSR, secure the northern flank, excuse me, to secure the northern flank, keep an eye on the Soviets. Win the war in China speaks for itself. Isolate China by moving into Southeast Asia and into Burma, you can cut the Burma road and isolate China by land and sea. Southern resources area, this blue circle. That's what we've been talking about. That's what you need to keep your economy and your war machine ready to go. Take the Philippines, best harbor in, the, in, the, in Asia at this point, Manila. Take the British colony at Hong Kong for its harbor and base as well. And then, and then cut, secure the Central Pacific, Wake, Guam, Gilbert Islands, Macon, Tarawa, and the Solomons here as well. This area that they aim to control, which they end up controlling, will be one-seventh of the globe. And you'll notice this dashed arrow right here. That is Kido Butai, the first air striking fleet, loosely translated. Six aircraft carriers, largest aircraft carrier force ever fielded up to that time, in fact, up to 1944 when the United States 5th, later 3rd Fleet, takes to the seas. Six aircraft carriers. They've got 10 fleet carriers in the inventory, six of which are fully, were built as, purpose-built as aircraft carriers. The other four were uh, conversions. And taking the cream, the core of their air fleet, and they're gonna bomb Pearl Harbor. The idea, strike there, damage the U.S. Pacific Fleet, strike it Sunday morning, they get good intelligence, they've got some good, a good espionage network on Oahu, strike at uh, dawn on December 7th, 1941, take out the fleet, and you knock out a major pillar of Allied defense. Because one of the things that everybody who looks at a map realizes, the one force that can really cause problems from outside Southeast Asia is the Pacific Fleet. So if you knock it out first thing, you take a major chess piece off the board. So that's the Japanese thinking for destroying the US Pacific Fleet. They've gotten a sense of how this can be done because the British had knocked out half of the Italian capital ships the previous November the 11th in the raid on Taranta, which for those of you who attended my Billy Mitchell talk 
back uh, several months ago, you may remember we talked about that rate a little bit. Japan has realized there are ways to drop torpedoes and bombs on ships in harbor and be able to, to do what needs to be done. This is a tremendous risk by the Japanese because if the United States is aware of what's happening, if they catch them at sea, Japan has risked a, has risked a significant part of their fleet. And it's a part of the fleet that it would be very difficult to replace. In fact, it proves very difficult to replace once four of those six aircraft carriers get sunk at Midway. The historian H.P. Wilmot, just to illustrate the relative, and I don't want to get too far on this tangent, but just to illustrate the relative industrial um, capacity of both countries, he pointed out that if the United States had lost every ship at Pearl Harbor and the Japanese had prosecuted all of their operations, to 1944 without losing a ship. There were so many ships that would, are under construction in the United States, the United States Navy in 1944 would outnumber the Japanese two to one. So these are, pre the, the, the reason I bring that up is Japan with these six carriers risks tremendous, a tremendous amount of men, personnel, equipment, but also national resources that are not easily replaced. And that's something that needs to be borne in mind. We look back from hindsight and that is somewhat lost. But at the time it was, it's something that needs to be borne in mind. At the time it was, it was a significant risk. The other thing I wanna point out to you as you look at this map is you will notice Pearl Harbor is part of, a, of an overall strategy. A lot of times that sometimes Pearl Harbor has been portrayed as an attack in and of itself, but it's only one part of a much more coordinated series of strikes. The other, the last point I will make before I get into get into some details of, of some things that happened 80 years ago today and around this time is I want you to look at the international dateline. I've talked to Pacific veterans and um, particularly those who were in the Far East when the war started. And as, as somebody who's written extensively about the war in the Pacific, the war in the Pacific started on December 8th. Every, basically everywhere but Hawaii. Because with the international dateline, 7.55 in the morning in Hawaii is roughly 2.55 in the morning in Singapore and Manila. For many of these people, particularly in the Philippines, the war starts not with bombs or bullets. It starts with a ringing telephone or in the middle of the night or a radio report. And so that needs to be kept in mind. And Pacific veterans have mentioned, and I've accounts I've read as well, December 7th actually was a pretty pleasant day in many of these places that would be under attack on the morning of December 8th local time um, because of the international date line. And that needs to be borne in mind as well. So the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, knocks out a significant part of the Pacific fleet. By luck, of course, the American carriers are at sea. And then a few hours later, a few hours from time-wise, but of course with the dateline, it's the morning of December 8th, the Japanese launch a variety of attacks. Um, they take the U.S. Legation Guard here at Peking, the, the North China Marines. They attack Hong Kong, and Hong Kong will ultimately fall on Christmas Day, 1941. Um, they will bomb Singapore. Uh, the, air raid, the air raid warden couldn't be found, so all the lights of Singapore stayed on <laughs> all during the raid. The bomb Singapore. That evening, Prince of Wales and Repulse will leave Singapore Harbor 80 years ago tonight. And on December 10th, they will be sunk off Malaya by Japanese aircraft. The first time major capital ships have been sunk in the air or, or in the open sea while maneuvering and actively defending themselves. Again, for those of you who attended my Billy Mitchell talk, you heard um, you heard a, a short discussion of that as well. They also strike the Philippines and knock out MacArthur, half of MacArthur's Air Force first thing. They also bomb Guam, they bomb Wake. And if you actually, if you listen to the full text of Franklin Roosevelt's message to Congress on December 8th, 1941, 80 years ago to today, he mentions all of these attacks in addition to Pearl Harbor. And he's correct. And he point, puts, puts a, a fine point on what I'm trying to say is that Pearl Harbor is part of a much more coordinated war strategy. And so the Japanese will get underway and within five months, they will control all of their objectives. 
and uh, they were forced the largest surrender of, in British military history here at Singapore. I had three relatives get captured there. They'll force the largest surrender in American military history at Bataan, April 9th, 1942, followed by Corregidor and the rest of the islands in May. They'll take the Dutch East Indies in March. They'll reach out to the Solomons in New Guinea, January, February of 1942. Wake will fall just before Christmas. Guam will fall December 10th. And as I mentioned, Hong Kong will fall on uh, Christmas Day. And then Burma, they'll cut the Burma Road and, and secure Burma by May of 1942 when the monsoon set in. So basically, they will achieve all of their war objectives within five months. It's a tremendous, at least in the Pacific, the war in China will go on until the end of the war. As a matter of fact, the majority of the Japanese army will be in China all the way through the war. But they've done it. It's, it's a tremendous achievement. They knocked the Allies off the balance within first 72 hours of the war by knocking out the three pillars of Allied defense, Pearl, Clark Field in Manila, and then forced Zed off of Malaya. And the Allies won't get their equilibrium back really until, until Coral Sea and Midway in the summer of 1942. But that's another talk for a whole other time. In the time that I have left, I do want to talk specifically about something that happened 80 years ago today that a lot has been written about, but there are some things that have been overlooked and um, some myths that I, I would like to, to debunk at this point. And I touched on it earlier. It's on the December 8th, nine hours after Pearl Harbor, MacArthur's Far East Air Force, 35 B-17s and another 80, 90 odd fighters of various uh, calibers are caught on the ground at Clark Field and at neighboring airfields around Manila, Iba, Nichols, Nielsen. A lot of people say that, stop at that. But there's more to the story. The Far East Air Force on the morning of December 8th, the commander, Lewis Brereton, had, sent a, had, had gone to MacArthur's headquarters and asked permission to bomb the Japanese at Formosa. They knew there were air bases up there. They had some basic intelligence of where they were. They also knew there were several hundred Japanese planes up there. Brereton wants to make a strike. The B-17 force is not at full strength. In fact, if you've watched the movie Tora, 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 the B-17s that famously fly in during the Pearl Harbor attack, uh, ferrying from the United States, ultimately are supposed to get to Manila. They never make it, of course. This force is 35 B-17s against several hundred Japanese fighters. I don't know how well they'd last, but they're too, they're too, they're too weak to really, uh, really attack and make significant inroads in Formosa, but they're too strong to sit idle, and they're too strong for the Japanese to ignore. And the Japanese on the first day of the war have plans to bomb from Formosa, take off at dawn, bomb Luzon, and bomb MacArthur's air, airfields and his air force. They recognize what an important target this is. That morning, Brereton is told to wait. And there's controversy over what happens. Upshot is he's told to wait. And then at 11 o'clock in the morning, Far East Air Force has said, okay, fine, you can strike Formosa in the afternoon of December 8th. In the meantime, the Air Force has not been idle. There have been reports of Japanese planes coming in. And in response to those reports, Brereton, not wanting his Air Force to get caught on the ground, has sent his planes into the air, either to patrol or to scramble after what turn out to be basically reconnaissance flights or very small preliminary raids. Where are the Japanese? What's happening? They've been delayed by fog in Formosa. And so the raid doesn't take off for five hours after it's supposed to. The Japanese think they've lost all surprise. Late morning, Brereton gets the strike order. Planes come down. They're running out of fuel anyway. They need to come down and refuel, rearm. And when they land, you look around, where's the war? There hasn't really been any fighting yet. So most of these men, it's still kind of a remote, distant prospect. So they go to lunch. And that's where they are when at just afternoon, the Japanese appear over Clark Field and other parts of Luzon. And as one of the men in the control tower says to the other one, it looks like the war is coming. And as the first bombs explode, the other one says, coming, hell. It's here. And MacArthur's Air Force 
gets significantly reduced. Half the B-17s get destroyed on the ground, a significant part of the fighters do. Some of the other ones that are landing with low fuel tanks are shot down. Um, it's a disaster for MacArthur's Air Force. There's no, there's no two ways about it. But imagine how different, if a couple of factors had worked differently, how all that might have been changed. And there's more to that story than what a lot of people hear, the short version is MacArthur's Air Force was caught on the ground. Yes, but they weren't necessarily caught napping. They had been up earlier. It was a confluence of factors that produced the result in the Philippines, which, all, which was a major strategic defeat for the Allies and a huge crippling blow to the defenders of the Philippines. And that, but that's something that needs to be remembered. And I want to, since we're on the 80th anniversary of that today, I want to, to mention that and make sure that that goes unremarked, or goes remarked, I should say, does not go unremarked. So that's where we are. That's how we get to this point 80 years ago today, when the Con United States Congress votes a declaration of war against Japan. Japan has, off, has opened attacks against various parts of the Pacific, and the United States Pacific Fleet at this point um, is picking up the pieces and trying to figure out what they can do to counter these Japanese moves. It's a story, our story ends 80 years ago today, but I want to bring you back and I want you to think about the wide ranging discussion that we've had up to this point. We started with a throwback actually to 1853. And certainly this is a process. What happened 80 years ago today, yesterday and today is the culmination of a process that was many decades in the making to going back into the 19th century. And that's something that needs to be kept in mind. The road to the Pacific, the road to war in the Pacific, the road to Pearl Harbor was long and winding. And it was very significant because when you consider in this part of the world, 1945 is yesterday, World War II, its memory, its aftermath is a geopolitical today. And the peace settlement and for example, giving Taiwan back to China after the war, and then it becomes a haven for Chiang Kai-shek after the, uh, Chinese Civil War and ends in 1950, 1949, 1950, not to mention the division of Korea, many other things that happened, the division of Vietnam and French Indochina. You see how this war affects the world today. And so if the war affects the world today so profoundly, this, we need to remember that, but we also need to remember the story of how we get into that war to begin with. And that's the story, and that's why this story today is relevant on the road to Pearl Harbor. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attentions, for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. And Steve, I'm going to throw it back to you, and uh, let's see what, what the audience has. Well, I, I think they are uh, been very enamored and enthralled with your, with your presentation, uh, as have I. Um, and uh, we don't have any questions in, in either of the... Uh, uh, comment sections on either YouTube or Facebook at the moment. Uh, but if you if you've been listening uh, to Chris and and something comes to mind, please go ahead and type it in. We'll we'll uh, we'll ask our our expert here tonight. Um, one of the things that that you were just talking about with the the uh, international dateline, December seventh, December eighth, uh, the attack on the Philippines versus Pearl Harbor. Can you put the time together? I mean, did how how long after? the first attack at Pearl Harbor, did the actual attack happen at the Philippines? Great question. And I can, I can actually do this pretty, pretty easily. Okay. Um, so I, to make it simple, I'm going to use December 8th time dates okay. because it's just easier that way. So as we, as we've established Pearl Harbor gets bombed for two, three in the morning, Manila time. Okay. About the same time, the Japanese actually are landing on Malaya and begin to shoot with the board of border guards. The bombing of Singapore is 4 a.m. December 8th. So the, the, these, these two attacks in Hawaii and Malaya are actually happening about the same time. As dawn breaks, Japanese raids, again, remember the dawn breaks in this direction. So the Japanese will bomb wake at dawn a couple hours, an hour or two later, when dawn breaks over Guam, they will bomb Guam. A couple hours later, when dawn breaks over Hong Kong, they will actually capture the border guard. I always felt sorry for those guys. They didn't even know the war had started. 
And the Japanese literally walked across, you know, the border crossings. They walked right across the border and seized them. Um, and then they will bomb Hong Kong as well shortly after dawn. At the same time, they'll take the Marines at the Peking Embassy and they'll send the reconnaissance flights over Manila. Remember, this is why the fog in, Man in Formosa is so important, is because as part of these dawn attacks, they're supposed to be striking the Philippines. But there's that delay. And so finally at lunchtime, they make their first attacks against the Philippines. The idea, the idea that the Japanese wanted to do was as dawn hit across around the around this theater, as we've kind of traced, they wanted to do a series of bang, 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 bang attacks. The timing works everywhere but where they have the delay in the Philippines. And ultimately that works to their advantage too. So, but it's it's a lot going on in a very short amount of space. But again, the Japanese had planned it that way. They wanted to strike a lot of places quickly, knock the Allies off balance, and then follow it up with ground invasions in the following weeks, which is exactly what they do. And uh, you know, also looking at at the map that you had, I think it's the the previous map. Um, if you can pop over to that one, there you uh, go. Yeah, thank you. The so basically, you notice all the red uh, in the in the uh, in the far east, with the Philippines in the middle. Uh, being the the only you know really uh, allied United States territory there that's really surrounded by with islands and and uh, areas that the Japanese have, have seized. So it even from this perspective, without looking at all the rest of the history that that goes with it, you can see where Japan would feel threatened by an American presence that close, knowing that between the two countries, they knew they something was going to happen, that they would go to war somewhere. So the, the inevitability of the Philippines uh, attack was was always there. I, I guess maybe it's the, the Japanese reaching all the way uh, to the Hawaiian Islands and then moving their way back that that uh, is somewhat of a surprise, uh, I guess. But as you said, they, they really were risking 60% you know, of their, their uh, carrier fleet on this one operation. That's true. And actually, I think that... Yeah. You know, having studied the Pearl Harbor attack, <clears throat> I think that's one of the biggest, the biggest failures on the part of the American commanders. You know, there's the United States knows that knows that war is coming. Uh, there have been the famous war warning message, and it's a direct quote. This is, you would take this as a war warning to all of the commanders in the Pacific on November 27th, 1941. There were officers in the Philippines that were writing that writing home. Um, I, I, there's a Filipino officer, I, I used his letters um, talking about, he says the war is on, for all practical purposes, is on in the Far East. And this is late November 1941. So it's tense. People know it's tense. People have a good sense that war is coming. The surprise will be when and where. Most people expected the Philippines. Most people don't expect, and this is true of the, the commanders in Hawaii, Kimmel and Short, Nobody thought, and even in the in the war and navy departments, nobody really thought the Japanese would would do what they did and risk what they risked to raid Pearl Harbor. But you know, they they did what they you know it was a failure to anticipate, and they planned on what they thought the Japanese would most likely do, as opposed to what the Japanese were capable of. And ultimately, it cost them. It cost a lot of people very heavily. And uh, a part of, uh, you know, you've heard the term the fog of war, um, the communication that we take so for granted today, mm -hmm. cell phone communication, you just pick up the phone, you can text, you can call. Uh, that was not, there was nowhere near that kind of level of communication that could come uh, from the United States, from mainland to Hawaii. And even as you start getting to the remote islands, it's all you know telegraph and, and very limited radio broadcast. So even being able to warn anyone further ahead in the attack was, was very difficult. That's true. And that the Japanese had partly banked on that. Um, communication in these days was by telegraph. Um, you may, some of you in the audience, I know, Steve, you probably have seen that famous reproductions of the famous telegram, telegraph blank, air raid Pearl Harbor, this is not a drill. And um, it's sometimes translated as this is no drill, but it's actually, this is not a drill. Um, that's how they communicated. When the War Department needed to send messages that the Japanese, you know, they've been reading the Japanese diplomatic code, they knew the Japanese were breaking off negotiations. 
and uh, they sent they had to send those by telegram. Ten years later, in 1950, when the Korean War breaks out, it's a teletype text conversation back and forth between Douglas MacArthur in Tokyo and Harry Truman and the Joint Chiefs in uh, in Washington. So even 10 years in the future, it, the communication is light years beyond what it is in 1941. And you're right, you know, that those kind of delays, there's all kind of delays that, that can come through. And uh, movies such as Tora, 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 books like As Dawn We Slept um, and But Not in Shame have talked about those and explored those to, in great detail. Um, and you're right, the communication, we're, you know, we're used to instantaneous communication around the world. We can do video conferences. I mean, look at us now having a video <laughs> conference far and reaching far and wide. That's just not possible in 1941. Uh, we do have uh, uh, some folks are uh, just chiming in saying they love the presentation. Thank you. They learned some uh, things today that they didn't know before. And that's the, the whole reason for for doing these webinars is to to help expand our, our knowledge. But uh, we've got a couple of questions that center on the movie Torah, Torah, Torah. And of course, okay. CA, CAF has the, the Torah, Torah, Torah group, uh, the longest running civilian air show act uh, in the world. And uh, the question is where any of the uh, CAF uh, B-17s or other aircraft used in the movie. Um, so it's actually the other way around. It's the CAF obtained aircraft that were built for the movie after the production was over. Uh, the B-17 Sentimental Journey and, and uh, Texas Raiders were not part of the movie. Uh, that's different B-17s. I'm, I'm not even sure the, the history of the ones uh, that we do see in the movie. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the Vals, the Cates, and the Zeros uh, that are in the Tora 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 air show today actually came from uh, the movie and uh, there's a, a whole story about how those airplanes were uh, uh, converted uh, to resemble uh, the Japanese aircraft uh, uh, from the from the movie because of course at that time there were no existing uh, flyable zeros Kates or valves so uh, they had to kind of put them together and and uh, use what they could to uh, to simulate uh, what those aircraft would have looked like uh, in December 7th December 8th, uh, 1941. So thank you for that question. Speaking of uh, those aircraft, we are in December. I've got to put in a plug for our 12 Planes of Christmas fundraiser, uh, which is going on all through the month of December. There are a number of aircraft that you can uh, help support, including uh, some of the Tora aircraft, our, our B-17s, uh, and the uh, the P-40 Warhawk. Those are just a few of the uh, featured aircraft. If you'd like to learn uh, more about the 12 Planes of Christmas and how you can support any of these uh, CAF aircraft, uh, visit supportcaf.org. That's our 12 Planes of Christmas uh, fundraiser website, supportcaf.org. Go take a look at, at all the aircraft that are there. Uh, Chris, just in the the couple of minutes uh, we have left, um, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave with the audience uh, about this very pivotal event in uh, history? I'd simply come back to what we talked about before, and I know we've you and I have talked about offline, is that when you look at, at World War II and you look at what the U.S. Joint Chiefs said in, in 1944, as a matter of fact, they said that this, the, the end of the war will occasion a change in history, an impact on the world, a change in history not seen since the fall of Rome. And that's a direct quote. And that makes World War II one of the most important events, certainly in the last 2,000 years. And I'm not saying that. They said it at the time. And so, as, as, as I leave you with this story, as we, as we think about what we've covered tonight, and we did, we covered a lot of ground. Um, this is an expansive story. World War II and its causes are an expansive story. But it's a relevant story, because when you think about the Pacific War, the memory of the Pacific War, how it remade Asia, how it continues to influence Asia and Europe in some ways today, World War II in general, um, that's why we need to study, we need to remember, and we need to use the lessons of the history to both inform the present and influence the future. And hopefully we won't make some of these same mistakes again, to be quite honest with you too. And so that, that would be kind of the final thought I would leave to people as they kind of think about everything that we've covered and, and are trying, if they're looking for a way to organize their thoughts and why this matters, um, I, would leave, I, I would leave people with that to think about. Excellent. And uh, you shared some some good news with us uh, before we went on the air uh, today about a, an upcoming